James Ward, developer advocate on Google Cloud. And we also have Ray. Hello, I'm Ray. I'm also a developer advocate on Google Cloud as well. So this uh, presentation is about the principles of developer experience. So let's talk a little bit about developer experience. So start with the cheesy definition of experience uh, So and then apply it to developer experiences. So the practical contact with and observation of facts or events. So developers have a lot of that every day, all day. And so some examples of that are like set up and configure a service via command line or a UI, use a library or an API, read documentation, learn something, try something, troubleshoot a problem, make something work, anything. <laughs> so we have a, a lot of developer experiences. And uh, usually when we talk about developer experiences, we like to talk about, is it a good developer experience? But what does that actually mean to be a good developer experience? Uh, here's an example of me having a bad developer experience. So you can see in uh, my my series of commits that uh, things are not working. I'm having a hard time. I'm struggling, and uh, this is a good indicator that that what I was working on here, I was not having a good good developer experience with this. Yep. And uh, here's a different type of experience that's relatively good. Uh, this is a tool called Error Prone. It's a tool that helps you identify bugs and issues upfront and early in your Java code. So uh, it's going to fail if it detected something bad that's happening in the code. And uh, you can see the error message if you click into it. Uh, right, there's a link that takes you straight to a page. And once you go to that page, it tells you exactly why this is a problem and uh, how do you actually fix it. Right. So um, it fails very fast. So you can go ahead and figure out how to fix the problem from the documentation. It has a lot of the reasoning behind the scenes to explain everything, right? So you understand why do you need to do this? And that's a pretty good experience. Yeah, definitely. Here's a frustrating developer experience that I had recently. I downloaded the latest version of Node and for Linux, and it gave me a tar.xz file. I don't know what an XZ file is. I don't know how to extract an XZ file. That is not something that I'm familiar with. And uh, what's interesting is that I did a Google Trends search to see uh, how many people were having challenges extracting XZ files. And when they switched from targz or whatever it was before to a XZ file, you can actually see on Google Trends that a lot more people are searching for how to extract an XZ file. And it's something that I do so infrequently that every time I go to extract the latest version of Node, I have to go look up how the, the uh, command line to be able to extract an XZ file. So that was, that was a frustrating developer experience. And uh, in the contrary, uh, we have this uh, other experience with uh, Spring Boot. Spring Boot is one of the most popular Java framework today. And um, you know it hasn't been too long. Uh, they kind of... Uh, took that developer experience seriously, and uh, now everyone is really liking it and using it a lot. And uh, if you go to their site, which is start.spring.io, it's a very easy, simple to use UI. And uh, you can add and configure your code, uh, like bootstrapping your application very quickly. And then you just click on generate. And uh, once you do that, it's actually a zip file. So you don't have to think twice on how to actually unpack it, uh, unlike the XZ file that GMs have to deal with. Yep, that's a good developer experience. Okay, let's go back here. Oop, click that link. Yeah, click that. There we go. Okay, so that was a good developer experience. Okay, so um, we've given some examples, but so far, the way that we've talked about these developer experiences are all about how they feel. It feels good, it feels nice, it feels horrible, it feels difficult, frustrating, all about feelings. And is developer experience really just all about feelings? Is that the only way that we can talk about it and categorize it? So Ray, uh, Ray has a story to tell us about how he um, came to a, a different mindset around this. Yeah. So um, you know, this is a story where um, I was so frustrated with one of the developer experiences, on one of the products. I'm not going to name which one, but uh, you might be able to guess later. But um, you know, I was so frustrated with this product, and um, you know, I, I was just in this unconference in Crete. This is a unconference that you know had a few. Now, maybe 100 people there uh, were talking about technology and stuff. And uh, we had these excursions. And one of the excursions, we uh, drove to this 2,000-year-old olive tree on the island. 
And um, I had a car, so I took three people with me on the car and asked them about the experiences I was going through. I was very frustrated. I was very you know, unhappy with you know, the outcome of it. So I asked them a simple question, which is the next slide. Uh, on the way to this olive tree, I asked them, hey, look, if you, have, if you have an application that starts up in two seconds locally, but it takes 21 seconds to start in a cloud, uh, what do you think about that? Like, are you not going to be frustrated or you know, what, what's your thinking process here? And um, I really thought that everyone is just going to say, well, yeah, that's pretty bad. But uh, to my surprise, one person said, it depends. And I almost stopped the car and um, asked the person to get out. Right? But now I didn't do that, of course. And so I asked him, like, why? Like, what does it, de what does it depend on? Well, this person said, well, it depends on which one makes me more productive. It depends on, you know, for example, the 21 second that takes to deploy and run. Uh, maybe that's a production environment that this person may have to spend otherwise hours and hours to create. And so compared to the hours or days that this person needs to spend in the environment, 21 seconds compared to that is nothing. And, uh, you know, it will be actually very productive if that's the case. And that is what occurred to me that uh, the, the developer experience that I was thinking about uh, has been, you know, maybe not the same as what other people were thinking about in reality, which is all about productivity. And then I had the, um, the, the thinking about, well, what does productive mean? What, what does it mean to be productive? And, um, you know, we kind of thought about this and said, well, maybe it's just, you know, how much value that you get over how much input you give uh, to produce this thing, to produce the value. And uh, the simplest form of the, the work that we put in is maybe we can measure it in time. And so for developer experience, um, what I'm going to say is that, uh, well, maybe it's productivity that's measured in value over time. And the value is really uh, the things that's really meaningful for the developer. For example, uh, going to production, being able to accomplish uh, some features, right? being able to adapt certain functionalities. Uh, and you know they have certain expectations on what they should be getting from your product. And the time is really just the steps and the amount of time it takes to achieve that goal. Okay, so it's a ratio. And um, and we think in this in this term, then what we can say is, well, sometimes I've seen like quick starts guides where it's a single page or very few you know steps, uh, maybe as simple as git clone and then deploy. But in the process of that, it's very quick. However, it doesn't really get me the information that I need to reach my goal, in which case it's actually not very productive. On the other hand, uh, because it's a ratio, if there are many steps involved and the time is actually relatively long, but the value that you get out of it is significantly more than the others, then it's actually pretty productive, right? And the worst that can happen is that you spend a lot of time trying to do something, trying to accomplish your goal that's valuable to you, and you couldn't get it done. Right? In which case, the value that you achieve is zero, and uh, you have zero productivity in that time. Cool. So in that case, uh, productivity is uh, probably totally measurable, uh, which what I'm going to say is uh, probably not measured by lines of code. Uh, it's really measured by the value that you get out of the work that you have done. So we, um, with Ray's insight, we, we were like, okay, now productivity and thus developer experiences can be measured, but wouldn't it be nice if we had some categories or, or helpful ways to measure them that weren't just uh, one dimensional, but provided uh, two different dimensions to be able to think about them. And so we're like, okay, let's think about all the good developer experiences that we have, all the traits of good developer experiences. So we brainstormed a bunch of different good developer experiences and wrote down a giant list, and it was, I think, even much longer than this, of all the kind of pieces to good developer experiences. And then we started to see some patterns form. And so we're able to take that list and reduce it down to four different core principles of developer experience. And so let's start with uh, principle one and Ray. Yeah. And uh, keep in mind that these principles are also aligned with uh, the the time and the value axes as well. So even though there, you know, a lot of these things that we think is good or not so great, uh, we're able to align them and deduce them into just these four things. And the first one is uh, respect the developer knowledge and goals. And this has a lot to do with the value that you're providing. 
Um, imagine if somebody comes to you know your documentation or start using your application and or trying to use it to develop their own application, and um, it doesn't really support what they already know. Then the developers might feel out of place, and uh, they have to relearn. And then now there's a learning curve that's significantly more. Um, but if we started to respect the developer's knowledge and goals, we will be designing the products and or uh, documentation around these knowledges and also the valuable goals that they want. So that when the developers see it, you know, they'll be uh, pretty forwardly and say, yeah, that's exactly what I want. Uh, and uh, let's, let's go, let's do this, right? So I'll show you a very good uh, developer experience uh, that actually uh, I think we think that uh, embodies this principle pretty well, uh, which is GitHub. So in GitHub, uh, one of the things they have done, which I we just realized, is I, this is so subtle that I didn't even uh, realize this until when we were doing this uh, talk preparation, which is that if you have a Git repository, which it understands what language it is using. So for example, I have a GitHub repository that has Java code. And if you want to create a GitHub action, it not only automatically detects that it is a Java repository, but it also presents to you, you know, some templates that uses commonly used Java build tools. Like in this case, uh, Maven, Gradle, uh, Scala with, with SBT. Like that's the three things that I ever, ever need for as a Java developer. I know these tools, right? I can pick one and I can get started. And that's a very good, uh, uh, you know, uh, demonstration of just respecting the knowledge that I already know. Um, and so there are some things that we can measure around these things, right? So for example, in this case, uh, the measurements is uh, really, uh, you know, maybe we need to ask the people the questions, you know, once they have gone through an experience, we need to understand, you know, did this experience achieve your goal? Yes or no? Uh, you know, was the experience consistent with the way that you have been doing things? Yes or no? Uh, did you learn something useful? Because that's probably one of the valuable goals that the developers may want to achieve. And uh, the best way to get these uh, answers is just to ask the question straightforwardly. And, um, and have the users respond to those. So you can really understand, you know, are you actually doing this um, and um, are they able to achieve their goals successfully? Cool. So that's the first principle. The second one, do the simplest thing that could possibly work. Uh, I'm an engineer and I, I definitely love to build the Rube Goldberg machines and have very complex, impressive solutions to things. Um, but we we really, as we're trying to find that, that uh, nice ratio between value and time, provide the best productivity, it's nice to have our experiences lean on the side of doing the simplest thing that could possibly work. And uh, we, I'm sure, have lots of, have encountered lots of experiences where you dive in and all of a sudden there's like 10 different things being thrown at you all at the same time and there's too much to learn and you're presented with a decision that you have to make that you don't understand how to make the decision yet. And so um, really what we should try to do with our experiences is, is do the simplest thing that could possibly work. And so I want to show you an example of that, which is something called Cloud Run Button. And so with Cloud Run Button, what um, I did was I made it so that we have a, something called Cloud Run, where we can run apps on the cloud. And uh, as a developer, a lot of times I just want to kick the tires on something new. I just want to give it a little run through. I want to be successful quickly. I don't want to have to make a bunch of decisions. I don't want to have to learn a bunch of things. And so Cloud Run Button allows us to go from a GitHub repo and to deploying and up and running on Cloud Run. So I can just click this Run on Google Cloud button on this repo. This is a really simple one. This could be on, uh, we have it on a bunch of different repos. And you can put it on your own repo if you want. And it's asking me to confirm that I'm sure that I want to proceed with this. And and now it's going to go into Cloud Shell, and it's going to automate a bunch of things that I may not understand are pieces to deploying an application on Cloud Run. So it's now cloning the Git repo, so I didn't have to learn Git to do this. It did that for me. It's asked me which uh, GCP project I want to use. I'll select that one. And then the only real decision I have to make is where do I want to deploy this thing? And I would actually love if we didn't have to ask the user. We have a good default, but um, at this point, I may not know or care where it needs to be deployed. So this could actually maybe be even a little bit simpler, but I'm going to pick US Central 1. 
And now it's walking me through the steps that are needed to take this repo and get it up and running on Cloud Run. So it's doing the Docker build for me. Uh, it also can do build packs or jib as well. And it's built the container image. It's pushing it to the container registry. So it's telling me what it's doing. It's not obfuscating or hiding the, the steps from me. Uh, and then it's deploying it up on Cloud Run. So I really didn't have to make very many decisions to be able to go from source code on GitHub to this thing now up and running on Cloud Run. And we can go check and make sure that it's all working. So there we go. That's the simplest thing that could possibly work. But you may be wondering, like, OK, that's great that we try to do the simplest thing that could possibly work. Uh, but not everything can be simple like that. Not everything should be simple like that, because that may not actually provide the value that the user is looking for or help the user achieve the goal that they're trying to achieve. And so hang on for the next principle when you're, if you're uh, thinking that. Um, but before we do that, let's talk about ways to measure this particular principle. OK, so this one, I think, is, is pretty straightforward to measure. It's looking at an experience and saying, how many unrelated tasks did the user have to do? How many, how many CLI things did they have to install in their machine? How many pieces of prerequisite knowledge or prerequisite software did they have to have installed? How many uh, steps did they have to go through? How many snippets did they have to copy? How many times did they have to search for what they're looking for? How many docs did they have to read? How many clicks, context switches, mistakes, wasted effort, decisions are a big one. I get paralyzed when I reach a decision in a, in a process and I don't know why or how to make that particular decision. So um, by measuring that, we can see, are we actually doing the simplest thing that could possibly work? But keeping in mind, we need to keep these experiences relevant to principle one and to what the goal that the user is trying to experience is, what, the, what they're actually trying to get through. OK, so that was principle two. On to principle three. Yep. So yeah, the um, doing the simplest thing uh, that could possibly work is definitely great to get started. Uh, if I want to learn something new, I have a go, and I should be able to reach that go without learning a lot. However, uh, as I progress and uh, bringing the system into production, right, the simplest thing that worked may not be necessarily the thing that I can bring to production, and uh, I may actually have to integrate with other parts of the systems. Uh, you know, turn that experience into something that's internal to my own company or you know the teams I'm working with. And uh, that's where usually you see the picture on the left, which is I will give you something that's very simple. And then you have to fill in the rest and draw a real all afterwards, right? And that is difficult. What we should be able to do is to allow you, the developers, to find the relevant information when you're ready for it and or uh, take you through the different steps so you can create the final picture that you're looking to create that is valuable to you. And, uh, and this is what we call learning should be incremental. Right. We should be able to allow you to find the information uh, as you progress through uh, your learning process, too. And so one of the examples uh, that um, you know, does this reasonably well, uh, we're going to use Docker, for example. Docker is one of the, you know, the most uh, popular container tool, right? Uh, it kind of bring container to the masses. And I believe that partially is because a lot of it is because uh, they have a great experience. And their documentation is also good. They can help you get started really quickly. But then on the left-hand side of the app, you can also notice that, OK, great, I can run a simple container. I understand what's there. Right? I understand the differences of container versus the VM. Now I want to build my own. And so they have the next step to show you how to build your own. And the learning is incremental in this way so that when you're ready to go to the next steps, uh, there's always the information there that can help you to get to what you need to do. Uh, and there are some ways to measure this as well. We believe that uh, all of these things are measurable. In this case, um, the incremental learning, we should be able to measure that, um, you know, were you able to find the information uh, easily and quickly? And by this, there are two parts to it. One is like, uh, if you try to find the information on Google or Stack Overflow, like, are you able to find that piece of information in the first page or even the first search result, right? Uh, and secondly, it's about the navigation in your documentation. In your doc, uh, are you able to help the user to understand the next step that they can continue in their learning journey? Are they able to find it on the left-hand navigation to find you know, additional details or reference documentations that really you know, digs into the details that's necessary for someone to take it to the next level? Um, and um, you know, one of, another question you can ask is, you know, do you know where to go next uh, to continue learning? Uh, are we doing this? Are we showing this to you so that you can make that choice? 
All right, and then the, the fourth and final principle before we get into some more uh, applicable ways to work with these principles is that wasted time is a waste. As developers, I think we spend a lot of time just waiting for compilers or waiting for things to happen or copying and pasting things that seem like we shouldn't have to copy and paste. And so we all have, uh, uh, I think, a lot of, of examples where we waste time unnecessarily. And so as we're creating developer experiences, we need to keep this in mind. Like, can we fail fast? Can we use caching in places to provide a better experience? Uh, there's a lot of places and a lot of room for improvement in this, uh, this particular world. Uh, so I won't give you an example of that one because I think it's pretty straightforward and I won't waste your time. Um, but let's talk about how to measure this one. So this one's also pretty straightforward to measure. It, we can just ask the user, did this take longer than it should have? Uh, how much time did you did it did it take versus how much time you expected it to take? Uh, do you feel like we've wasted your time? Um, or, or how much time do you think uh, we've wasted? Um, and so, uh, and then uh, what per, what step prevented you? So a lot of times wasted time just comes in, this didn't work. And so then I had to go spend hours on Stack Overflow trying to figure out the, 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 the missing piece to why this didn't work. And so one of the, uh, oh, we'll talk in a little bit about ways that we can actually instrument documentation to, to track this kind of stuff. But um, so it's pretty straightforward to measure. So to give a quick recap, principle one, respect the developer knowledge and goals. Uh, principle two, uh, do the simplest thing that could possibly work. <laughs> and three, sorry, Ray, I did those uh, backwards. <laughs> uh, mixing it That's up, okay. keeping people on their toes. All right, yeah. principle three, learning should be incremental. And the last one, which is the wasted time is a waste. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, how we can practically use these principles. So uh, I think many of us at this conference are in developer relations. And so, so how do we help, help uh, product management and engineering teams provide b better developer experiences, deliver better developer experiences? So we have a couple techniques to, to talk about that we use, and, um, and so we'll go through those. So the first one, which you may have heard of, is a technique that, that uh, Google Developer Relations and, and other folks use is called friction logs. So a friction log is when I start using something new, uh, I'm on Google Cloud, so when I start using something new on Google Cloud, I just take a log of everything that I do, everything I try, every piece of documentation, every Google search I do, everything that I'm doing, every command I type, uh, I just keep a log. And uh, I'm uh, as I'm going through this experience, I have a goal in mind. So I in the in the friction log, I state what the goal is, and then the what my goal is, and then I start logging. Um, but then we have a way to color code the log to provide some visual feedback as to how the experience was. And so we color code with, with green, uh, orange, and red. And these are all subjective feeling based. So, so we can say like, like, oh, this was awesome, or like I was annoyed or frustrated at this part, or oh, I'm so angry, I would quit uh, over this. And so you can see this particular friction log that I wrote recently. Um, there was some frustration there. And so I was able to send this friction log off to the team and uh, hopefully help, help them have a better develop or create a better developer experience uh, going forward. So the color coding is subjective. It's how I feel about this in the context of my friction log and everything that I did. But what Ray and I recently did was we took our principles of developer experience and we added this into our friction log template. So now we can provide a snapshot TLDR of the experience related to productivity, value over time, using the uh, principles of developer experience. So what we do is just have a grid with each of the principles, and then we also use the color coding as a way to indicate how well this experience did, uh, how, how I was able to meet my goal and the challenges that I ran into. So uh, this is just a, a way for us to, uh, to categorize the experience that, that we had into the principles 
with the hope uh, that that's more actionable. Because if I just were to say like, oh, I like struggled in this part, uh, then, then it may not be something that is actionable or something that helps us actually move that developer experience forward into a better place. And so, um, so hopefully this will be, uh, be a tool for the product management engineering teams to have more directed uh, information for where to, how to improve the experience. Okay, so that's friction logs, but we can also do collecting metrics. So uh, the other way to kind of measure um, the productivity set of things, um, and, you know, if you're doing this after the fact, then uh, you can measure uh, documentation, for example. Like, for example, how did the user find your documentation? Uh, how did they rate your documentation? But uh, typically, this is what we see in a documentation site. You have a way to get feedback where uh, the user might rate it to be, uh, in this case, one star, which is completely unusable. Um, if a documentation is unusable, I probably won't even spend the time uh, rating it, to be honest. But a lot of people might just walk away, right? But it's nice that some people will give you this feedback. Uh, or that on the other spectrum, uh, it is excellent documentation. I hope that every documentation has five stars. But then we also have something in the middle. What happens to these middle stars, right? So in this case, if you have three stars, it's an OK documentation. What does that mean to be an OK documentation? Why isn't it? Great. Why isn't it excellent? And what makes it not 100% unusable? But still, like, why isn't it a great documentation? In this context, there's no way to understand the documentation uh, in terms of how valuable they are to the users and um, you know how much time the user may have spent on this. Um, so one of the things to think about it here is that um, you know maybe you can, uh, in addition to just rating the documentation with stars. Uh, ask the questions. You know, if somebody spend the time to rate a documentation to be, um, you know, not useful, ask the question of why is it not useful, right? Go back to the measurements and ask the yes or no answers, and hopefully uh, we can categorize the reasons why certain documentation are not great. Uh, you know, in some cases, these, uh, you know, they allow users to send the feedback, but uh, again, you know, free form feedback, you know, user can type whatever they want. Um, and I don't know, uh, some sometimes I just write, well, the documentation is not great, but uh, there's, again, it's not very actionable in terms of why that's the case, right? Tell me more. And so the easiest way is to just ask the questions, okay? And uh, another idea that we had was that, uh, you know, if I'm going through a documentation that has many, many instructions, and uh, sometimes I might just wanna copy and paste the instructions, and, you know, some documentation have this copy and paste icon, and uh, you can potentially measure that, and you can know how many times people copy and paste it. And if the user copy and pasted through the documentation halfway and then stopped and never accomplishes the rest of it, maybe there's something wrong with the documentation, with the instructions. Maybe they are stuck. Uh, in which case, it's also great to ask the questions of, you know, why are you stuck and where are you stuck? And um, and you can see some documentation do better than the others. And the last bit of it is, of course, uh, both of these things, the vision log and uh, measuring the documentations and stuff like this, uh, this all happens after the fact. This all happens after the product has been produced, right? And uh, you know, I, I think I truly believe that in order to have great developer experience, uh, we need to do this from the start, right? Work with the different teams up front and early and instill some of these concepts into the product design itself. Um, as part of the DevRel teams, that's what we should be doing. And uh, make sure that the products are being developed in the way that uh, provides very good developer experience. All right, and now I think we have some time for questions. Excellent, thank you so much. So um, I'll be monitoring the Slack channel, but um, Dave, do you wanna start out with some questions? I've got some of my own, but won't yeah, take up all the time. I also, I just want to make sure people know that when I when I go like this, I'm not rolling my eyes at people, but I have a really tall monitor and my questions are way up here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I love the talk and I was tweeting about it like crazy, um, but I was also curious because you mentioned working with other departments, but you also mentioned effective metrics. And I was wondering how, how important is it to push back on metrics that, um, don't focus on developer goals, given that different areas of the business may have different metrics already in place. Yeah, it's easy to measure the wrong thing or the thing that doesn't matter. <laughs> so how do we, how do you convince people to measure the right thing um, is hard. <laughs> and I, I think know. it takes some uh, experimentation, right? I think, um, I, you know, when people want to measure something, I'm sure there's a, a reason of why. Uh, it may not be the reason that I, 
understand or agree. But uh, in terms of you know developer experience, there are some measures that we should be taking uh, to understand this. And I think this is a field where uh, we're kind of pushing the boundaries, right? So uh, it takes some experimentation and to uh, validate uh, some of these uh, principles and measurements as well. It's yeah. an interesting narrative because you both mentioned it, and then also Charles Pretzer mentioned previously working with different departments. And then looking all the way back to Modi's talk um, a few hours ago, he mentioned you know moving from being in engineering to being in DevRel and having a lot of buy-in at the company. And so I'm I'm curious if you know like having that buy-in from different groups actually allows you to focus on more effective metrics and have a more effective team. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, what what we have the freedom to do a lot with with Google Cloud DevRel is to build something that we think will be better than exists currently, and so we we uh, are able to take a a show not tell approach, and that's what I did with Cloud Run Button was was I was like there should be a better way to to go from a GitHub repo to running on Cloud Run, so I just went off and built it. And like, that's cool, like everyone. And so this has actually impacted now uh, the product. And so the so this is not, Cloud Runner Button is not an official product, but they, uh, they because of, I think, uh, influenced by Cloud Run Button, they took one of the steps out of the getting started experience for Cloud Run and they noticed that mm -hmm. adoption went up. And so, and so it, that was actually validating that keeping it more simple actually increased the number of people who were getting through the process. I had a question on change management. Um, so you guys talked about um, the first principle, including you know work with what your what is consistent with your current developers' knowledge, your customers' knowledge, and you gave the example about the um, the node tar.xz file or uh, yeah. Um, so sometimes you do have to move the needle. Like for example, there is a period in which a lot of people didn't know Git, and maybe you're moving in a direction, and you're thinking, well. I kind of need the generation of people I'm working with to use Git to make this possible. And now it's like pretty pervasive. There's no friction there. But when you're at that place, like what would you what would you recommend? Like how to how to move the needle but not create too much friction. I like that you brought up uh, Git in particular because that was definitely a, a huge shift in thinking for a lot of us who are used to. Um, SVN and, and CVS before that. And I, I vaguely remember, this is a while ago now, but I vaguely remember a lot of the content that came out around that time was targeted at people who knew SVN. And so it was saying like, here's how you take your knowledge of SVN and go from that to Git. Instead of just saying like, here's Git and it's amazing and here's how to use it, they created this bridge from where I was to, to where where I wanted to go. And so, so yeah, I don't think it rules out, I don't think that principle rules out the opportunity to teach people new things and even very different things, but there has to be bridges between those worlds. Yeah, Anything same here. Um, when, I, um, when I learned Git, that's also what happened to me. In fact, I switched what, version control three times, CVS to SVN to Git kind of thing, like a lot of people may have gone through it. But I think that this is where the other principle really um, is important too, uh, which is the learning should be incremental, right? We need to make sure that people from all experiences and all levels is able to learn. Uh, and there may be people who um, you know, are just brand new and never used uh, version control in the past. And we need documentation like that to support those use cases. And but then we also need to respect the developers who uh, also have been using other existing um, ways of doing things and how do they bridge into uh, this new world. Um, it's very important to have both. Yeah. So do you have experience of, of getting those metrics first as I, I guess in the product process, right? And say, okay, this is our sweet spot right now, but then there's also this group that we want to you know, win their hearts and minds, but they are in this space, early adopters, later adopters. Have you gone through those steps and really making those decisions with the metrics you need? Uh, we've we've begun doing that. So we um, we just came up with these principles pretty recently, and and we are working with some product teams to start actually measuring them to see how effective they they are. That's that's been one of the interesting points of, of feedback around the principles was how do you know that these are the right principles? How do you know that these are actually like dr driving the product in the right 
way or driving the developer experience to be actually better. And so that's something that we're working with with some of our internal teams on adding the principles and then doing some some tests. Like I guess at some point it ultimately comes down to like customer satisfaction. Like like are, are more customers coming in? Are they happier? Or is the net promoter score increasing or something like that? Maybe a way to actually validate this. But um, but we we only have a little bit of anecdotal uh, evidence right now that this is correct. And then Ray and I's experience from working with developers for a long time, but still anecdotal. Um, so James, I am so glad you brought up and emphasized over and over the issue of decision fatigue. Yeah. Um, and it kind of goes back to something that Charles said in his talk, right? Your users often don't know what they don't know and they're often stuck and asking questions based on really limited information. So, and I think we've all experienced that onboarding experience. Where like, why are you, I don't know, why are you asking me this? Like, you know, it's like a whole um, product uh, experience process. So can you break down a little bit more like how you've been influencing that? And obviously you've had so many different uh, company experiences. Uh, how have you, yeah, brought that topic up and really created actions to change the experience. Yeah, it's it's certainly one of the harder things being in DevRel is to we have this this mindset in DevRel from spending a lot of time with people who don't know the product and we're trying to help them learn the product. Whereas engineering typically they know the product you know, they know everything about the product because they built it. And so it's very hard to like go back to that beginner's mind that the people that we're working with in DevRel have. And so for me, what I've tried to do is bring the engineers and product managers with me, bring them to the workshops where people are mostly on Windows machines, bring them to the to the conference where they are spending time with, with people who are not like them and are not like the people that they interact with and try to try to help them build the perspective that we in DevRel have. Because um, I'm sure that a lot of people in DevRel share the frustration that it's very hard to just tell them how it is, that they, they need to arrive at the view of the world that we have on their own journey, not by being told by us. And so, um, so yeah, a lot of partnering with, with engineers and, and product management on that. Yeah. Ray, anything to add? Yeah, um, I think, um, the culture shift is uh, very hard, right? In some cases, um, I think we have had successes with some engineering team who are, uh, you know, for example, the team, there's a team in New York that where I am uh, building out the Spring Boot experiences for Google Cloud. And they work very closely with the ecosystem. They know uh, and work with the Spring teams. They work with the, uh, the open source contributors and the users file GitHub issues and they understand what the issues are. They really spend the time and, um, and investing in the community in that respect, right? And uh, and because of this, uh, they kind of they 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 understand what the users need um, more so than you know what the, you know potentially what the product wants to do, <laughs> right? And because of this, through this uh, engineering team, uh, because of this cultural change in my mind, uh, they were also able to through them uh, influence the product directly, um, influencing other products, and. Um, and to me, that's very powerful. Uh, like, I feel like sometimes that DevRel is trying to uh, do everything, but um, in a different mindset is to, you know, enabling other teams to do uh, the good stuff where they can actually be so sufficient in, in making these uh, product changes uh, because that's what they have learned through the community. Yeah. yeah um, can definitely happen. Yes. Thank you. Um, and my last question is, you started and ended with the concept of time and the perception of time. I really, I really appreciate that. So um, with that fourth principle, like, um, yeah, how do you have more detailed ways to help us to understand if when people are waiting, when there's like, are there ways that maybe, you know, like, I'm in the Kubernetes space. It's just going to take time to get those clusters out till you finally get to see what the solution's going on. So are there ways that we can be creative and be like, well, while you're waiting, here's a cool video to watch or like, so they feel like their use of time is always high value. Have you guys done anything at Google? 
for that. <laughs> I don't know about uh, at Google, but Heroku, I think, did a really good job of this. Uh, a lot of things in Heroku just happen instantaneously. You provision a Postgres database, it's available instantly. Mm -hmm. And so they use a lot of Slack pools to keep things just ready so that as soon as somebody wants it, it's there. And I love that because for me as a developer, like why can't Google Cloud just keep some Kubernetes clusters sitting around waiting to be used? You know, I don't know if that actually would technically work or not, but maybe, maybe it doesn't. That's maybe why it doesn't happen that way. But um, but I, I think there is uh, there are techniques that people can do if they if they really want to deliver a Heroku awesome developer experience, they can use techniques as they build products to not make users wait. Yeah. And uh, sometimes the, the perception is that, um, you know, this happened in the past where you type a command line and uh, there's nothing being printed out for 30 seconds. And you just don't know what this thing is doing. So just some more verbose output that's useful, right? It, just like what James went through with Cloud Run button, right? And the whole process took, you know, some time, but uh, every step of the way you can actually see what this is doing. And so you feel like, you know, I, I feel like I'm not wasting my time. I'm actually reading it and learning something new at the same time. And that's that's cool. Um, sometimes in like a code lab, uh, for example, um, I run Kubernetes code lab a lot. And when you do create a new cluster, uh, I actually do ask people to watch a video. So, <laughs> right. And that helps, uh, in the context of a code lab, um, yeah. it can definitely be useful. I have any weird memories of somebody having a game, like people could play a game and it was actually quite well designed, but it might've been a different context. Um, anyway, thank you so much. And thanks, Dave, for your questions. Um, this is all great um, moving for the, the, our journey of, of um, developer experience and, and all these sharings. So I really, really appreciate this keynote so much. Mm -hmm.